gold and silver clearly are not dead. <laughs> they're tradable assets, meaning they, they're on an exchange and they can trade you know, every second of, of a trading day, 23 and a half hours, whatever it is, around the clock, you know, around the world. So you know, they, they clearly have value. Investors obviously see that. Gold is still, what, 1750 or whatever, 1780, as you and I talk. Uh, silver is up from its 2000 low, so, or, or the past 20 years. So I, I don't buy this argument that they're dead. If they were dead, then they would be, gold would be at $250 an ounce and silver would be $2.50 an ounce, something like that, you know. I think this is why Harry Dent, and not to call somebody out, but just to use his, him as an example, why Harry Dent is wrong. I actually bet him because he kept saying gold's going to as low as $250 an ounce. I wrote him an open letter. He accepted my bet and he lost. And I think this is the one of the core reasons. And he paid me, by the way. He's, he's actually a very good, he was very gentlemanly about it. So that I was really going to be my that. next question. <laughs> yeah, I got an ounce of gold from him. It was great. He sent me a check for to buy an ounce of gold with the premium. He's He was a true gentleman about it, you know. But that's the key difference. He doesn't see gold and silver as money. And I do. And Mike Maloney does, and many of us do, right? And that's the reason. Because it's money, it's going to always have value. And this has been shown uh, to occur over 3,000 years plus. So who should I believe? 3,000 years of history or some analyst who comes along and wants to get his name in, in lights and headlines uh, saying gold is dead? Who should I believe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I'll pick Mr. History over over uh, some guy on CNBC. So what I did is I actually did get the average of the gain in all the other assets. Again, this is in metals, hard commodities, soft commodities, stock market, um, real estate, all of these things. And I just took the average gain of all those assets and applied it to silver. And the average silver price would be $250.28 if it averaged the gain of all the other assets from 1980. So, I mean, come on, everything should adjust upward over time just to account for even a little bit of inflation. It should be much higher. That's how much other assets have adjusted for inflation over 41 years. If, an, if silver does the same thing, the price would be over $250 an ounce. Mm -hmm. You you wrote another article analyzing time between past silver spikes. So what did that time end up at as well? Uh, that's a another good question, Tom. Uh, basically, what the history shows is that silver is you know stagnant for a long period of time. It's boring, boring, boom is how I was characterizing it. That's its DNA. That's what it does. History shows this over and over and over again, right? Uh, we even saw it last year, right? It was boring for a while. It sold off a little bit in 2020. And then boom, it rose 140% from March to August just last year. So big spikes, right? Well, the time between, so I thought, well, what is the time between these spikes? And it did vary greatly. And of course, the time between spikes when it was a bear market was longer than when it was a bull market. If you take out the bear markets and you look at just the bull markets, the average time span was two and a half years between these big spikes in the silver price. Well, it's been over a year now already since the last one. Uh, so could we have another year to go? Sure. But one interesting thing is that the average was actually never hit. It was always sooner than two and a half years or longer than two and a half years. So, uh, you know, we don't know. But what we do know is that another spike is based on history is inevitable. So another one is coming. I think it's our job as investors to prepare for that. Uh, I don't own any bullion ETFs. I don't want any paper gold, anything like that. And the main reason is because I don't want counterparty risk. I want to control either in my possession or under my control uh, in some way, uh, the actual physical metal in my title and, and, and name. Um, I, I don't want a paper product. And the reason is because uh, we might actually need the physical in the upcoming environment. If things get really nasty, I mean, look at it. Everything's overvalued today, bubbly. What if this whole thing comes down at the same time? I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but it's that, that reality, that possibility is definitely there. If this whole thing comes crashing down, 
there is going to be a lot of ugly counterparty risks that are going to show their, you know, rear their ugly head, right? And, you know, that could apply to bullion ETFs. I don't want counterparty risk. Think about it. Why would I take a low risk asset, asset like physical gold and silver and put it into an environment that makes it more risky, that exposes it to counterparty risk? I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, under normal circumstances, if it was a normal economy, normal markets, normal monetary system, hey, owning a paper gold product may be fine, but not in the kind of environment that is likely to transpire over the coming years. I want to minimize my risk, not add risk to my gold and silver holdings. And so for that reason, I own physical only. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as far as the mining stocks, that's that's more of a speculation, obviously. I think everyone knows that. Um, that's you're trying to gain leverage on the move up in gold and silver by owning mining equities. And I, I do spend a fair amount of time in that. I love it. It's fun. But I am aware of the fact that I'm taking more risk by doing that. Um, but you can certainly add juice to your portfolio if we're right about the direction of gold and silver. And that's the key. Some people are asking, well, aren't gold and silver stocks going to crash if the stock market goes down? Well, the key there, the answer to that question is, what are gold and silver going to do? Mm-hmm. If you think gold and silver are likely to rise you know, over time in response to some event, then the mining stocks are likely, historically, they will follow gold and silver. If you think gold and silver are headed down, then the mining stocks are going to follow them down. So in other words, they're more likely to follow gold and silver themselves as opposed to what the S&P or the Dow do because gold and silver are down, they're going to follow and track and do what gold and silver do with leverage either direction. But because gold and silver haven't attracted the mainstream back to their market yet, they have the mainstream hasn't looked at gold and silver miners yet. Uh, So the upper, you know, the, the point of that is that there is great opportunity still available in the miners. If someone doesn't have exposure and wants to get it, it's not too late. Whereas it might be too late to jump into the S and P now, and you know, jump into maybe some cryptos or something, or jump into real estate. Those things have admittedly run up a lot in value. The only thing that hasn't is gold and silver and mining stocks. So the so the value is still there. But the answer to your question is because gold and silver haven't moved, the miners haven't moved yet either. But they've admitted as much, and many analysts have admitted as much that it's really. It's not just a demand issue, it's also a supply chain issue. And, and I think everybody knows that. Everybody knew that when the Fed started using this transitory word. I mean, it, just every day we were bombarded, transitory, transitory, right? Make it the word of the year. I mean, th- these guys just pounded it into our head. And I was very skeptical. And I, I even said publicly, look, I don't think it's going to be transitory. And now look what the Fed is saying, like like you just cited there. They're saying, well, it's time to retire that word. You know, it's going to last well into 2022. You know, many supply side uh, manufacturers, transportation, all these things are saying it's going to last into 2022. Be prepared for it. So, you know, the Fed was wrong then. So uh, and they've been wrong many times. Right. You know, remember Bernanke saying the 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 the. uh, uh, housing market is stable in 2006. <laughs> you know, he was horribly wrong, horribly wrong. So I wouldn't follow the advice of, of what a Fed official or a government official has a vested interest in trying to be positive and, you know, trying to, you know, keep the market stable and up and that sort of thing. I wouldn't put my trust in that, you know. And again, the evidence of that is all the supply side you know, uh, manufacturers and and the whole chain was saying, look, this is a problem. This is going to last a while. And that's exactly what's playing out. So I do still fall into the inflation camp that it's going to go higher. But here's the thing. There's good evidence for deflation out there that that could be coming. And there's good evidence that we could be going into a stagflation. So what's it going to be? Well, Tom, I sleep well at night because I don't have to answer that question. Mm-hmm. If I own a meaningful amount of physical gold, I don't have to answer that question because it's not about inflation or deflation. It's about crisis. And when there is another crisis, gold is going to do its job. It has a story for 3000 years. And so while it's fun to talk about these issues and debate them and say, I think I'm right, you know, it's going to be inflation or it's going to be deflation. I enjoy those debates. 
But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if I have a meaningful amount of physical gold under my control. And so that's what I focus on. I, re I really do.